charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. The Simple Truth. Rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Havens. It is great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. It is Catholic Family Men Monday, where we primarily direct the content to men, most especially to those of us who are called to the vocation of marriage and family, in order to build up husbands and fathers in Christ to bless the family and to sanctify the world. But make no mistake, everyone is is certainly most welcome to listen in and or watch plenty here that is valuable and applicable to all. Very much looking forward to today's episode. Our guest today is Norman Fulkerson. He is raised he was raised in Red Hill, Kentucky. He's a 38-year veteran member of the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, TFP. You can learn more about them at tfp.org. Norman is also a contributing editor for the, for the TFP's Crusade magazine. In his Only in America column, he describes the little-known cultural richness of the United States. He's also the author of the award-winning book, An American Night, the life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC. And that's the topic for today. We're going into that book, Lessons in Manhood from an American Knight, the life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC. And uh, this book uh, truly blew me away. So many great lessons in here that I think are very applicable uh, to men who are striving to fulfill their vocation of husband and father, certainly also to those who are striving to fulfill their vocation as as priests, as pastors, as bishops even. Um, So much good in here with the good example of Colonel John Ripley. Also for men in oftentimes the little known vocation of consecrated single life, and that's where Norman's coming from today. He has that vocation, and that's a vocation he is answering and striving to fulfill each day. So, Norman, tell us a little bit about yourself by way of introduction and that vocation to be a consecrated single man. Yeah, I, uh, as you said in the introduction, I'm a full-time member of the organization Tradition, Family, and Property. A lot of your listeners for sure have heard of TFP. Many people know us through our videos our TFP student action videos. Well, the way that I uh, met the TFP regarding manliness, as we said um, uh, before this interview, Jim, uh, what attracted me to the TFP was when I met the first TFP member, I, um, what, what really struck me about them was their manliness and their, their piety, their religiosity, but it wasn't a showy religiosity. Uh, it was really um, those two things that really attracted me to the organization was the manliness and the um, and the piety, which for me, those are the two things that the knights of old, they embodied. Hmm. Outstanding. All right. And as we get into this book, An American Knight, The Life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC, U.S. Marine Corps, Um, There is so much in here to really pull out by way of examples of manhood. What is it that first drew you to uh, the manly life of John Ripley, his life as a role model, as a good example? And and what examples have you have really stuck with you over the years? What rises to the top? Well, regarding Colonel Ripley, the way that we know, know, the way I got to know Colonel Ripley was through the organization Tradition, Family and Property. He was a strong uh, supporter of the TFP. We came to know Colonel Ripley when we published, actually it was the last uh, book of our founder, Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira, and it's a book called The Book of Nobility and Analogous Traditional Elites in the Allocutions of Pope Pius XII. And the book is essentially a book that talks about the role of leaders in society. So we met Colonel Ripley because he was one of the invited guests to speak on the military panel. We had social elites, we had members of um, the military, Colonel Ripley being one of them, members of nobility from Europe. 
So he was really the big draw for the for the audience when we launched that book at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington D.C. And it was because he he embodied like what it means to be a Marine, but he was also a very uh, staunch Catholic, and uh, he was very he was very manly. He was no nonsense. After we met him on that occasion, I stayed in touch with him over the over the years leading up to his death. And he came to give a couple of talks to members of our organizations, to our supporters. And he, um, it was just the, he was the full package. He was very manly. He was very pious. So that's where I, I, the whole idea of an American knight came out. I think he embodied the principles of the knights of old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and as I as I read through this book, so many examples jump out. It, it was uh, quite natural for me in my excitement to want to go to portions of this book and read them aloud uh, to my wife and children because it's like, look, I, I'm learning from this example. I want you to learn from this example as well. Uh, th- th- there's so many good lessons here. One that jumped out was a lesson really from his family growing up, his, his mom and dad, um, and really the example of his father in praying the rosary with the family and taking that very seriously. And he learned to take that very seriously too. I think on one occasion, even uh, even stopping the rosary and saying, hey, anyone want to play tennis? Because he noticed how distracted everybody was, uh, multitasking, doing other things. So he cracks this joke, but the purpose was to say, hey, let's get our attention back on really praying these mysteries. And this is where it all begins for us to really be serious about a life of prayer. And I love that we're seeing that even in his family growing up, he's in that training about taking prayer seriously. Did that, uh, was that something that jumped out to you as well? Oh, oh, it was. And I, I think I might've mentioned in the book, obviously, uh, who was it? I don't know if it was Churchill or someone that said a man's education starts centuries before he's even born. And I saw, I, I wish I, I never knew uh, his father, um, uh, Mr. Ripley, but I, I would I would love to have known him. He was very much a chesty puller type man. He uh, there's a picture in my book of he and Chesty Puller together, and I, I never got to meet him. But there was another fact regarding the praying of the rosary that I, I liked a lot. Uh, I, one of the sisters was going to go out on a date, and the the young man came to pick her up right before the rosary. And then at a certain point, they said, "Okay, well, bye. We're going to leave." And Bud said, uh, Bud Ripley said, what, you're leaving? We're praying the rosary. You're not leaving until you pray the rosary. So that did jump out at a lot, uh, a lot for me, Jim. I, um, the, the fact that the, the father also was a very Catholic man, and he was very much a man. He was very much in charge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so they have the serious of prayer going on that you point out and give some great examples on that. But then also um, this sense of, um, of, of training on skills, but also bringing that um, with the family all together in the evenings and, and playing music. So a lot of the siblings were well-trained in, in different musical instruments, or they'd be practicing them as they're growing up. The father is sitting there working on his book as they're practicing his World War II book. And John, he wasn't working on an instrument, but uh, he, could, he would be willing to, to sing out a tune. And so uh, it, th- this all bared fruit as, as they continued to grow as a family and the, fa- the siblings getting really good on these instruments, John singing along, it would really become uh, quite a festive environment. It must have been a, a, great, a great joy to be a part of it. And then reading through the book, seeing that you had the opportunity to go and visit his family home, correct? And, and visit with his, with his sister in, in right where that all would have been taking place. Do I have that right? And what was that experience like? Oh, that was great. I contacted his sister early on, and I, I, I almost have the impression that his his sister's vocation was uh, to stay alive because she she was the last living member of the family long enough for me to be able to interview her because she really was the one person who um, supplied all the information for the early life of Colonel Ripley. So I went and stayed with her and. The home that she lived in up to the time of her death was the same one that when Colonel Ripley was alive. So she described Colonel Ripley coming over to visit. He loved uh, his drinking his beer. He was he had a very rich, very strong personality. And 
and they would be drinking beer and singing and talking and and at a certain point somebody would uh come to the door and colonel ripley would get excited and jump up with such energy he would almost turn the table over and so there was a lot of life in the family and then mrs goody kuntz would play the um susan his sister would play the piano for me she was an accomplished pianist and she would play some of my favorites like the navy hymn and which was played at colonel ripley's funeral and as she did so, I would see the the pictures on the wall of Bud Ripley, of Colonel Ripley, um, his brother Mike that died in the a Harrier um, accident. He was test flying uh, the Harrier jump jet and his brother George. And uh, yeah, it was a very lively family. Very, very lively. Mm-hmm. So yeah, some great examples for fathers right there. Serious about prayer. Go ahead, Norman. Yeah, and I, I was also going to say I saw the the bridge. There's a bridge behind the uh, ch- the family home that crossed the New River, and it was a railroad bridge that went across and stopped on the other side. It just ended, didn't go anywhere. The bridge to nowhere, and it was actually that bridge that Colonel Ripley would walk, climb underneath to overcome his fear and get his nieces and nephews to do the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, an amazing part of the story. Uh, so providential that that's where he was living and, and, and he had the opportunity to train on this bridge and, and really bring his uh, his boyhood out on this bridge, crossing hand over hand in, in his Huck Finn years as they were described. And that's all part of God's training for what's gonna come next in his life years later when he's in battle in Vietnam. He's asked to do the seemingly impossible and that training all comes back and much more training that, that he, he went through up into that moment. Moment. And so a lot of good examples here, serious about prayer, also being alive w- with life in the family, and, uh, and also being serious about training, serious about participating with God's grace and following his providence and so much more. We're going to be right back at American Night. Stay tuned. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question. Why is your Protestant Bible four ounces lighter than my Catholic Bible? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a faulty scale? Nope. Well, maybe it's just the weight of the paper or the cover or the binding or some introductory comments. We wish it were just that simple. No, it's the seven books that got dismissed by team Martin Luther. Secondly, audacity. Audacity allowed Luther and others to extract time-tested truths of Scripture and key letters from the canon. What? Yes, about 1,200 years after the Bible canon was fully established, they rejected seven Old Testament books. Not only that, Luther placed the New Testament books of James and Jude, Hebrews and Revelation in a category called, quote, the disputed books. And thirdly, a pesky comeback. If I were to write a deeply personal letter to my wife regarding our future descendants, don't be taking seven of my choice paragraphs out of that letter. Why? You might be robbing those future descendants of a little bit of who Papa was. Now, don't you do that. This is Jesse Romero, host of Jesus 911, heard weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. I'm joined each day by a variety of co-hosts like Ruben Nava, Paul Clay, Dan Schneider, and my amazing wife, Anita Romero. We tackle Catholic devotions, spiritual warfare, family life, saving America, and everything in between. Join us each weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific for Jesus 911. You can also catch a bonus encore Saturdays at noon Eastern. God bless you. Keep the faith. Do you love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. True Jim Havens here. We are talking today with Norman Fulkerson on this Catholic Family Man Monday, Lessons in Manhood from a book that Norman Fulkerson has written, An American Night, The Life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC. You can get it by going to tfp.org. Go to the store there. You can just go store.tfp.org. This is a book 
that I highly recommend. It is a, a, an easy read, a, a very fruitful read. You're, you're gonna, there's gonna be things that uh, that pop off for you in this book that that we probably won't have the time to get to today. There is so much good packed into this book. Just want to highly recommend it. An American Night again, tfp.org. Go to the store and get it there. So, uh, so John Ripley, Colonel John Ripley. Uh, he grew, he's a Catholic man. Grew up in a, in a Catholic family. Some converts in there, I believe, is uh, his mother was a convert, I believe, and then his um, his wife ended up as a convert as well to the Catholic faith, and also a long line of uh, of military um, folks in the military. So a military family, a Catholic family, and that's the background where. John is coming from. I want you to take us into that moment, uh, Norman, that, that decisive moment when John is a young man and he's, I believe, working, maybe selling newspapers at the time. I forget exactly what the job was, but he's noticing that he's coming into contact with different men in the in the various branches of the arms, armed forces. And he's really drawn uh, to the Marines in particular. And, and there's a manliness that stands out there. You also mentioned in the book, again, the title, An American Night, about the those commercials from the 80s where um, we, we saw the, the Marine Corps being juxtaposed with the, the, this idea of knighthood and, and chivalry. And I remember those growing up. I was born in 77. I remember those commercials. And there was something that, that calls you on just by watching a commercial like that. Speak to us about that. What drew, um, what drew John Ripley uh, to the Marine Corps? But also what, what draws us when we see these things as well? Well, what drew Colonel Ripley, it was, I think it was a couple of things. It was the, if I'm not mistaken, it was a uniform, but their bearing, the, the, they held themselves with a, a tremendous pride in who they, who they, who they were, who they, what they represented. Actually, after I wrote the book, my mother, <clears throat> my father was in the Air Force for a brief period of time, four years. And my mother was very proud of me for having written a book. And, and she told me at a certain point, she said, but she said, you know, Norman Beale, my father, he, he was in the, in the Air Force, but she said, I always, I always loved the Marine Corps. And so I had the same type of attraction as a boy as well with the Marine Corps ethos, the, the uniform, the bearing, the pride that they exhibited. And that's really what attracted Colonel Ripley the most to the, to the Marine Corps as well. Mm -hmm. And the commercials you mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a curious thing because those commercials were very explicitly uh, playing on the idea of a night. And one of the one of my favorite ones, you, you'll remember, Jim, was there was a crusader that was com coming into a castle or excuse me, a cathedral. The doors open. He rides in on his horse like he just came from battle with armor and he gets off of the horse. And as he's riding in, the children are looking up at him and with admiration. You could tell in their eyes, I want to be that. And he rides up to the front, uh, to the altar, gets off, and he kneels down. And the, um, the priest or whatever, the bishop, puts a sword on his shoulder. And all of a sudden, there's this explosion, and the knight disappears, and it's, it's United States Marine. And... And it's curious because I dubbed Colonel Ripley an American Knight, and I can remember distinctly the first time I talked to a Marine about the title of my book. It was actually Colonel Walt Ford, who was then the editor of Leatherneck Magazine, and because I wanted to see if they were interested in maybe promoting the book and advertising it in their their magazine, and Colonel Ford, I remember him firing questions at me. It was a little bit intimidating. And when he asked me, well, what is the title? I was, I was a little bit hesitant because I thought that he would think that it was a bit anachronistic to dub a modern day Marine as an American Knight. And when I told him the title, he said his response was, yep, that was John. And that was the most common response I got among Marines, especially those who knew him well. They said, yep, that's, that's John. All right. I think I had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. I'm not sure what, what came across, but for me, I wasn't able to hear the very end, but that's all right. I do want to plant a seed here with the audience that um, I do want to return to this theme in a little while regarding 
what really draws us as men, even even as boys, um, in terms of um, something about manhood that draws us, something about strength, something about our own masculine strength that um, that, that we are often told is not is bad, or we're shamed for it, or we're we're trying to t- be told it doesn't exist. We're going to get back to that. I want to affirm that masculine strength using the words of something that, that John Ripley himself said that is so powerful um, that I've never heard it said quite that way. So stay tuned. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But I, I want to get to what he is most known for. He went through extensive training. The, the, the guy was incredible. He wasn't a great student academically early on. He made up for it with hard work. His dad, in fact, would help him by shutting him in his room and he'd stay there and he'd study. So he really had to will himself to do that side of things. The physical aspects, it seemed to come quite natural to him. He seemed to really enjoy it and thrive in that environment. So he went through all kinds of training, Rangers and and Navy SEALs or what would become the Navy SEALs and um, so much. I mean, just illustrious training. And then he gets at this point, I believe it's his second tour in Vietnam towards the end of the Vietnam War where they're trying to help the the southern Vietnamese army to really rise up on their own, but there's still advisors in there, and he's one of these advisors. And so he gets in this this battle, this Easter offensive that that takes place where um, they're being bombarded by the the northern Vietnamese army that's coming um, at them, um, lots of tanks, lots of troops. It's not looking good. He's out there, and uh, basically, it comes down to that he's got to he's got to destroy this bridge, the Dong Ha Bridge, or else all these tanks are going to come across, and they're just going to keep rolling. This is going to be a massive problem. So they radio in his commanders radio into him, and um, and he radios back and he says, "We're going to stay here." And we're going to die here. He, he, it seems bleak. He's going to give it everything he's got to try to blow up this bridge. But uh, he, he knows that um, it's going to be a very tough, uh, a tough objective ahead of him. And, and he's very likely not to make it. He says this, the idea that I would even be able to finish the job before the enemy got me was ludicrous. When you know you're not going to make it, a wonderful thing happens. You stop being cluttered by the feeling that you're going to survive. It's a, and then you write here, Dong Ha was not the first time he had been on the hopeless side of desperation. So he, he then goes into this objective of trying to, to blow up the Dong Ha Bridge. He's absolutely exhausted. I want to let him tell it in his own words. Here's a clip of Colonel John Ripley himself. This comes from the American TFP YouTube channel. You can go there to find it in its entirety. But here's just a clip in his own words Colonel John Ripley, think about what he went through, what he was able to overcome. Here it is. I had at that time been awake uh, and fighting, continuous fighting, uh, for three solid days and nights. No rest. Uh, You wouldn't uh, actually engage the enemy at night other than by uh, artillery and generally small arms, but uh, nevertheless, you're awake and you're fighting. And so I was exhausted when I started. I also had not had any sort of sustenance apart from a sip out of my canteen uh, during those three days. Nothing, not even a tiny little bowl of rice that we generally had two or three times a day. So that my body was uh, run down. Uh, I was very exhausted, but physically exhausted. But I had a a tremendous focus on the mission, what I had to do in order to in order to stop the enemy. I had a tremendous focus on uh, the requirement, the obvious requirement that I do my duty, do it correctly, and uh, that I could be counted on. When I moved from there out over the river. Despite this uh, commitment that I had taken, this personal commitment, my body seemed to be failing me. Uh, I was a fit individual, but because I'd been run down over this period, uh, despite being very fit, uh, I I could feel that uh, this was going to be a very tough chore. And as I hand walked out, I began to rhythmatically Hand over hand, I would say, I can recall so clearly, Jesus, Mary, get me there. 
And this rhythm, uh, this simple little prayer, Jesus, Mary, get me there, and over and over and over. And the strength came. It just came. It was uh, perhaps phenomenal. Uh, it's easy to explain, but it's not easy to understand. And yet it worked. For me, it worked. A perfect example of uh, faith in action. And the result of uh, your faith, no matter how strong, assisting you in a very physical way, in a very tangible way, uh, when you really need it. Boy, did I ever need it. All right, so that is, in his own words, uh, Colonel John W. Ripley there. And we're talking with Norman Fulkerson today, who was the author of a, a, tr a tremendous uh, book about Colonel Ripley. It's called An American Night. You can find it at tfp.org. Go to the store there, store.tfp.org. Um, looking at lessons in manhood from the life of Colonel John Ripley today. Norman, so many lessons just in that uh, short description that, uh, that Colonel Ripley gives right there. What jumps out to you at the top? What jumps out at me is, um, is obviously the Catholic aspect. Colonel Ripley was um, a Catholic, and I don't believe in this, this, this thing of, uh, I think it's Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking, that you can do anything you put your mind to. There's a certain truth to that. I mean, you, you can do a lot, but man has limitations. And I think Colonel Ripley understood that very well. And that's why when he reached his limitations, and what you said about him being trained in all kinds of special forces, he was a quad body. He went through four of the most grueling special forces programs in the world. One of them was UDT, the precursors of the Navy SEALs, uh, Army Ranger. He was the first uh, Marine inducted into the Army Ranger Hall of Fame. But he realized at a certain point, a human being reaches their limit. And when, he re when a person reaches their limit, what do you do? You call out uh, for help uh, from God. And by the way, uh, uh, Jim, when he did that, he was facing the largest communist offensive of the entire Vietnam War. That, was, that uh, amounted to 30,000 troops, 200 enemy tanks. And they were shooting at him while he was under the bridge. There was a tank that had been disabled that was firing um, 100 millimeter rounds at him and all the while he's going back and forth a dozen times so it's 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 appealing to God when your strength is failing that's the biggest thing that comes out yeah yeah he he, he puts forth the maximum effort of his will but he's also calling upon God's grace and, and trying to participate with, with God's grace it really is the best of both we see coming together it's a great example for us and also another example is he, he mentions he doesn't mention it there but he mentions it in other spots that i write about how um some of the in the in the southern vietnamese army at this point they thought all was lost and they just kind of dropped their guns and started wandering around in the chaos he thought in some way well this seems impossible all may be lost you know i'm probably going to lose my life here but he doesn't walk away from it he dives into the responsibility, dives into the challenge of it and says, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go giving it everything I've got. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. While abortion supporters continue railing against Friday's loss of Roe v. Wade, they offer only scant mention of the Dobbs v. Jackson case. Justice Samuel Alito's argumentation tears gaping holes in the logic that upheld Roe v. Wade. Roughly speaking, court actions from before Roe v. Wade imagined that due process from the 14th Amendment could be turned into privacy. Privacy could be used to strike down contraception restrictions. Then Roe extended that to abortion. In Dobbs, Justice Alito blasted those extensions, quoting other rulings before his, that to be valid, such new rights must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. The violence over the weekend to protest the loss of Roe has resulted in attempted murder charges. LAPD Chief Mikhail Moore says that criminal activity is not an exercise of First Amendment rights and promised vigorous prosecution. Freeways in at least two West Coast cities were blocked as part of the anarchy. This is Life News Radio.
A culture of life has a rarely mentioned but very formidable enemy. Pornography is material that deceives its consumers into thinking that they possess beauty, while the reality is they are possessed by a lie. The first step may be to talk openly with your pastor or confessor. Reject the lie and recognize that a culture of life relies upon you. A live-action investigator went undercover at the controversial D.C. abortion practice of Cesare Sant'Angelo. The released video suggests disturbing practices there that make abortion patients both vulnerable and drugged when they are asked to make surgical consent. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Norman Fulkerson. He is the author of the award-winning book, An American Night, The Life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC. Highly recommend this book. So much that is so good in here. We can only get to some of it today. There really is no substitute of getting this book and spending some time with it. It's going to make you a better man. I guarantee it. Go to tfp.org. Go to the store there, store.tfp. Dot org. Um, I want to look at, at this excerpt real quick before we hear one more clip from Colonel Ripley and get uh, Norman Fulkerson's thoughts on it. But but this is from the book, and this is in Chapter 12 about the fatherly care um, that Colonel Ripley had for his men. At this point, he's Captain Ripley, and he jumps in, into this foxhole next to this 19-year-old Lance Corporal who had been wounded. He, he's back on guard duty, and um, and Captain Ripley jumps in, and he, he starts talking with him, and, and it says here, uh, Norman writes, the, the atmosphere of the unexpected nightly chat must have resembled more the visit of a chaplain than that of a battlefield commander for the calming effect that it had over him. Early in the conversation, Darden was honest about the fear he had about his arrival in Vietnam. Captain Ripley assured him with a patent like response, there is not a person in war who is not scared, he told him, but you can't let fear control you. By the time their talk was over, Darden was a changed man. What impressed him most about his commander was that he never asked one of his men to do what he was incapable of doing himself. He was a true leader who led from the front rather than pushed from the rear. And that really is the way that he led. He was there in the front, shoulder to shoulder uh, with his men. And uh, really an incredible man, an incredible life. What a witness in so many ways. And that's just on the battlefield, much of what we're talking about so far. We're going to get to what, uh, how he was a great example off the battlefield with his moral courage um, later on in his life. But, but before we get there, here's that one more clip. And then we'll get uh, Norman's thoughts on this. Norman Fulkerson, author of An American Night. One more clip here from Colonel John Ripley, here it is. Oh, Dan, I thought for certain that I would never make it out of there. And I could not, uh, I simply couldn't get that out of my mind. I was constantly thinking about my three very young children and my wife and and how my loss would affect them. And uh, it was just more than you can imagine, the, the terrible feeling that that represented. And yet, through this virtually continuous prayer uh, very simple Jesus Mary get me there get me there and uh, and the rhythmic aspect of that uh, you would have to do it to understand it the way I'm describing it but what a huge difference it made and it was successful and the success I like to think came from that very simple prayer all right, so he's crediting um, God for showing up, right? He called upon God and he showed up. He called upon specifically Jesus and our mother Mary. And just that simple prayer, how powerful it is. You can pray it throughout the day. Jesus, Mary, uh, get me there, right? In, in times of difficulty, in times of fear, in times of trial. Jesus, Mary, get me there. Uh, so powerful. And yeah, what a, if there's one very small but very powerful example, I, th I think you're right, uh, Norman Fulkerson, for, for pulling that one out when we went to the last clip. That's really it. That just He, he was a, a man that relied on on prayer when it came down to it he didn't give up he went to he went to god he went to our lady um anything else that jumps out to you here yeah and, and a true man is not <clears throat> he's not ashamed to, to be seen on his knees 
especially on his knees in front of a, a statue of the Blessed Mother, showing a tender devotion for the Mother of God. I wanted to say something about that uh, bridge incident that Jesus Mary get me there. You know, I want to put a plug in for um, a song that one of the TFP members, Ben members who works at our office down in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, wrote and composed the music for the, a song, The Ballad of an American Knight. And if you Google that, there's a YouTube video that is very well done. I highly recommend people people plug into that. But yeah, it's, it's the idea of, of true manliness is also um, a true man is also capable of kneeling uh, in front of a statue, in front of our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament, and, and seeking recourse, uh, strength to make it through difficult times. So yeah, share with us a little bit more about the aftermath here. He, he blew up the bridge. I mean, people have to really read the account in the book um, to really get the, get the full sense of it. But after that, um, well, well, let me even just say this right before that, that, that uh, you know, the, the, what he went through was just incredible. He had to crawl over some wire. He thought it was barbed wire at the time, turned out to be razor wire, tore him up. That was just to get into the bridge. And then he's making multiple trips, a dozen trips or so back and forth, um, carrying heavy weight of all the explosives that he was carrying back and forth. He passes out at one point and then uh, he, he gets kind of, there's a, an explosion that goes off near him. It kind of, the, the ripple of the, the shell shot kind of runs through him. It wakes him up. Um, he also, by the way, said he, he never really slept his whole time in Vietnam. He always had the radio next to him and he was kind of always somewhat conscious. And uh, I mean, he really paints a picture picture of just extreme sacrifice. At one point, there was a dentist who looked at him and his, there was blood in his teeth. And he just says, look, you're under so much stress. That's what's going on here. Um, so to see that extreme, I think this is where he helps us in so many ways. We can see uh, the extremes in him that, that, that are so amazing based upon the, the amazing training I think that he went through before that. And then we can look at that and say, look, if he's able to do that, right, it, what am I able to do? Maybe my limitations are a little bit more than what I think they are. Maybe what, what I've been expecting of myself, I've been setting the bar a little bit too low. If this man can get this much out of himself, what more can I get out of myself? What, what sort of reflections have you had that, that have helped you when, when, when you uh, reflect on the life of Colonel Ripley? Well, you, one of the things you didn't mention, I'm sure you remember this part of the story, is that he would carry, there were th during his tours in Vietnam, he was almost killed on, I think, Two, two or three occasions, I think it was three occasions, and he had the the shell casings of those, uh, the bullets that meant to kill, they were meant to kill him, and he would keep them on a, like a key ring, and he would carry them with him all the time, and he said whenever one of his kids would be complaining, oh, you know, I'm having a difficult day, Dad, he, he would show them those bullets, and he would say, you are not having a difficult day, you don't know what a difficult day is. So that's one thing that comes out. But another thing I wanted to, to draw you, um, the listener's attention to is the fact that, so he, he's, a, he's a man's man. He's going through the stress. His teeth are bleeding. He's going through so much stress. As you said, his dentist told him that. But in the midst of his, this gung-ho uh, act of courage, unbelievable heroism, when he had the bridge all wired up, it was about ready to explode, set the time fuse for about a half hour. He looked and saw the the mother carrying her baby walking down Highway One. And the, and the North Vietnamese they were intentionally bombing the civilian population to spread terror in the South. So she was walking with her baby. Half of her part of her leg was blown off. She had a makeshift splint, and a certain distance behind her was her daughter, who was crying hysterically, trying to keep up. And Colonel Ripley saw that gut-wrenching gut scene, and he said, if this bridge blows, he said, that, that child will never survive it. So he momentarily forgot about the bridge. He'd already wired it. It was set to explode. He went running towards that little girl, swooped her up in his arms, and almost when they reached the mother is when the bridge blew. And he went pirouetting into the air, fell into a ditch, actually on top of dead bodies, and the girl was on top of him, and he said the last thing he saw were chunks of the Dong Ha Bridge pirouetting up into the, into the sky. 
Now, I think that is one of the one of the many examples of how the idea of an American knight, like the knights of old, because the principal idea we have of a medieval knight is an individual who protects um, the weak and defenseless. So especially women and children. So again, once again, it's uh, to be a man, you have to be capable of showing that tenderness, as I said before, towards the mother of God and towards women, towards ladies. A true man respects and honors women. It does not disrespect them and abuse them. But uh, anyway, that's just some of the things that come to mind regarding, regarding his manliness. Terrific. Norman Fulkerson is with us. He's the author of An American Night, The Life of Colonel John W. Ripley. You can get it at tfp.org. Go to the store, store store.tfp.org. Yeah, right along the lines of what you're saying, you write in the book that although he had seen the worst side of human nature and the most violent aspect of war, he never lost a tender side capable of caring for the little ones. You go on to say this tender solicitude for the weak and defenseless defenseless was an essential characteristic of the medieval knight, but one that is often overlooked when exhibited by a Marine like Colonel Ripley. And you um, you even go on to, to share a story about how um, he was concerned about uh, yeah the pigs of a farmer um, being killed, and and he, he cared about that farmer and, and his livelihood. So he said, hey, let's not let's not uh, do that. Let's not do it that way. And then uh, he also um, after he he saved that um, that, that mother and um, and baby and, and then the the girl he still continued to think about them after the fact after the um, after the bridge the bridge was blown up and then he was thinking about okay now we need to uh, call down our artillery fire um, to, to to rain upon the enemy here but hold on where'd that little girl go you know where where might they have gone and then he went and he finds them and makes sure that they're safe first he can see that they're safe and then he calls on the attack so little things like that we get to the heart of the man what else can you share with us this is such a powerful part of his story not just uh, the warrior in battle on the on the battlefield physically um, but it may be in, in some ways more difficult on the moral battlefield he comes home and then even within the military um, now we see it to the to the full this um, this hyper um, ideological ideologicalism going on in the military, the, uh, the the woke military that it's becoming. We used to see the medieval knight in the ads. Now we're seeing um, a girl uh, with two moms in the ads for the armed forces. I mean, they've really gone in the other direction, and that was starting to happen um, when he was um, he, he had moved on from the battlefield, but he was still in the military and still involved, and, and he would speak up. He would lend his voice to really say what he believed in, even when he was going to take a hit. With his career, he really didn't care what happened to him. What cared, what he cared about was telling the truth. Tell us about um, this side of Colonel Ripley. Oh yeah, well that's that that is really what I consider. Um, what, that's what really makes Colonel Ripley great. And I think it's the I don't know if you noticed it, but I think it's the high point in the book because what he um, the founder of the TFP Tradition Family Property, Professor Plinio Correa Giuliveda. He, um, he once said something interesting, that there are two types of courage, physical courage and moral courage. And he said, of the two, um, moral courage is much more important than physical courage. Um, well, he actually talked about physical pain and, and moral pain, moral suffering, and moral suffering being the most difficult. But moral courage, uh, Colonel Ripley defined it as the courage to to stand up, to take, a, uh, to take a stand when they turn up the heat. So I think the high point in Colonel Ripley's life was after he got out of the military, he spoke out on a number of hot button issues at the time in the, the mid nineties, especially during the, the Clinton administration. Uh, for example, he spoke out against allowing open homosexuals to serve in the military and against sending women into combat. And actually I think my book is the only place you can find those testimonies in print in their entirety, uh, unless you're Sherlock Holmes. And the reason that it's in the book is because Colonel Ripley personally gave copies of those testimonies to us. And, and what he used when he was giving them before the House Armed Services Committee was um, he, used, he used the notes. So that is really what defines Colonel Ripley's uh, greatness 
is by standing up on issues that were politically incorrect and he knew that he would be jeopardizing um, his future, his legacy, how people would look upon him. So that's, that's what makes him great. Yeah, Norman Fulkerson is with us. The book is An American Night. You can get it at tfp.org, store.tfp.org. When we get back, we're going to go to that testimony from Colonel Ripley and hear him in his own words. This is the point that I planted to seat on earlier if you've been tracking with us here. Um, this, to me, is one of the number one lessons that I take away from this book. So affirming in, in what is the masculine strength that our society today, when we have uh, Marxist feminism baked into such a high degree that tries to shame men for their masculine strength instead of affirming them in it and, and reorienting them. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. At the Station of the Cross, we are blessed by the variety of donations our listeners generously contribute for our evangelization efforts. From planned gifts to employer matches, we even receive donations through transfers of stock. Please consider giving a gift of stock to help us continue sharing the love of God with our hurting world. If you are being called by God to donate through a transfer of stock from your brokerage account to ours, please ask your broker to contact us at 1-877-888-6279. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred as well as the QCIP number of those shares. That's 1-877-888. 886279. Thank you for considering a gift of stock to the Station of the Cross so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Keep up to date with the shows we bring you each day on the Station of the Cross by viewing our programming grid on our website, thestationofthecross.com, and on our iCatholic Radio app. Just click the menu icon in the top left portion of our app and select the link to our programming grid. That's at thestationofthecross.com and on our free iCatholic Radio app for Android and Apple mobile devices. Howdy, this is Adrian Fonseca, producer of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show. We're happy to be with you on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. We strive to keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and a look at the breaking news of the day. Join us on the Catholic Drive Time Show every weekday morning at 7 a.m. across the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. That's every weekday morning at 7 a.m. We look forward to seeing you there. God love you. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest today, Norman Fulkerson. He's got a terrific book, An American Night, The Life of Colonel John W. Ripley, USMC. We've been talking about that today and taking some lessons in manhood from that book. You can get that book by going to tfp.org. Go to the store, store.tfp.org, and find the book, An American Night. Highly recommend. In the back of the book, you do have these testimonies from Colonel John Ripley. This is a testimony, a portion of the testimony from 1992 in the Presidential Commission on the Assignment of Women in the Armed Forces. And this is what Colonel Ripley say, he says. He's trying to make the distinction here to say, look, if you're talking about women in combat, then, then let's be real about what combat is. Don't say women who are in other areas of the armed forces. If you want women in combat, let me explain to you what combat is. And, and I want to say that I want to uh, flesh out this example um, in his words by, by having um, us think of men, that masculine strength that, that we are given, that it is good. Understand that it is good. It is not something that we should be ashamed of. It is not something that we should not believe in. It is there. It is real. It is good. And it is there for good reason. God has given it to us for good reason. So if you're a husband and father, use that masculine strength in a virtuous way. Direct it to what is good, what is authentically loving, and use that masculine strength. Make the most of it. You have it. If you think you don't have it, it just means that it's probably been beaten out of you at some point. You've got that masculine strength in you. We've got to grow in that masculine strength and using it in the right way. Colonel Ripley is a great example of that, and his words here, I think, give great inspiration. I've never heard anybody speak quite like this, but this is a guy who was in it in Vietnam and other conflicts. He was a warrior on the front lines. This is what he tells us about combat in his own words. This is what he says, combat is combat. 
It is, it is an overt, aggressive act. It is not passively awaiting something to happen in a, in a risk environment. He goes on to say, combat suggests aggressive, violent behavior, violent behavior, and the satisfaction, the enjoyment that derives from this behavior, that is an essential part of combat, at least among Marines. He says, take, for example, linebackers. Linebackers love to crunch somebody. They get a big kick out of knocking, uh, knocking not the player down, but anyone down. There is a satisfaction derived from this sort of aggressive behavior. It is common in males. I'm not saying 100%, but it is common. And someone can probably define that by chemical balances, testosterone, and all the other things. I'm not sure what causes it, but I can tell you it is common. And if it isn't common, this man will never be a good Marine. We don't want him. Combat suggests this type of aggressive, violent behavior, which begets some degree of satisfaction from having encountered and crushed the enemy. A good feeling, a feeling of victory, a wash of emotion. There is something good about this. I do not subscribe to this feeling that we hate to fight. We don't like to fight. Somebody's, or, or he says this, I don't subscribe to this feeling that we hate to fight. We don't like to fight. Somebody's got to do it. We did it and we enjoyed it. That did not mean that we would like to be there or that we were warmongers or we necessarily promoted the fact that we were there. We sure as hell didn't. But we got an enormous amount of pleasure out of taking the fight to the enemy and ruining him in the process. That is combat. He goes on to say combat is an aggressive act, the operative term. You must go after the enemy. You must go for his jugular and you must enjoy doing it at least to the point of requiring you to do it again without deriving some emotional hang up there from um, powerful 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 words from Colonel Ripley again I don't know that I've ever heard anybody speak quite like that and I think he's entitled to do it as he's just sharing his personal experience and what he knows as a man on the front line in battle and what he's seen of his other men as he's led them again it may be in, a, in an extreme example there but men, you have a masculine strength that is meant to be rightly ordered and used for the good. And this is very good and it must be affirmed. Norman, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think there's a line in there somewhere where he talks about the football player, like the linebacker. He said he likes to hit, hit someone. It doesn't matter who, just anyone. So yeah, he, he sums it up very well, but I, I couldn't help but think as you read that and as we've been discussing this idea of manliness but also the religiosity because there's two sides of it the capacity for tenderness uh, that's exemplified in uh, our lord jesus christ during our lord's life there there were the episodes for example when he when he wove a whip with his own sacred hands and he drove the money changers out of the temple with it and actually people don't, some people don't realize this but it, he didn't do just do that on one occasion. He did it on two occasions, driving the money changers out of the temple. And I heard a, a, a description of that by a military man saying that what he did was incredibly heroic because he went into the temple by himself. He was like a, um, he put it in military terms, without any backup, without any support, and single-handedly drove them the money changers out. But that same person, our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome the little children to come unto him. But anyway, going back to that quote, uh, Jim, yeah, there's not much more to add to it. I mean, that is really the uh, one of the beautiful expressions of manliness, the ability to take the fight to the enemy. And when you mentioned earlier about, um, I think it was the Patton quotes, um, that every man fears in battle. I think Patton said this, the one who doesn't is either a liar uh, or he's a crazy man. <clears throat> But Colonel Ripley was a type, I, I don't even know if he feared in battle because he he was, the, his men that served with him said he always had a smile on his face, even in the most difficult of times. But yeah, there's not much more I could say about that, that, that courage that's expressed in that part you just read. Yeah, certainly a heroic fortitude in physical battle for sure. And we saw it again also on the on the moral uh, fortitude side as well. But it, there again, a story about the physical battle at one time. Uh, he there, somebody had, was a machine gunner shooting at them and uh, he ran single handedly and took him out. I mean, that's the kind of guy that he was. He loved the line, press the attack, which he got from one of his heroes, Stonewall Jackson. Um, and that's a that's a good, valuable lesson for us. Press the attack be aggressive to in doing the good be aggressive in loving your wife well be aggressive in, 
in loving and providing and protecting your children. Be aggressive in, in doing what you can to reject error and to and to cultivate truth and to and to help build up uh, your parish, help to go out and do good apostolic works, help fight off the scourge of abortion and, and all of these other uh, things that are that are coming at us in these days. Um, press the attack. If only we did. If only we did. Catholic men, we need to hear these examples and we need to be inspired by them. And uh, and, and Norman, I want to give you the last word. We're coming on to uh, just a couple minutes to go here. Um, but any final thoughts, just to wrap things up, anything else that you want to make sure to share with us today? Yes, I wanted to just, I'm glad you gave me a chance to say just a concluding thought, a message to your listeners is that uh, Colonel Ripley, when he spoke out on those issues like homosexuals in the military, women in combat, those were not the only issues that he spoke out on. He also spoke out about uh, VMI doing away with their all uh, male admission policy. Now all the service academies have women. And uh, so he was not afraid to speak out. And actually his t- son, uh, ta- son, excuse me, Thomas told me, who was also a Marine, uh, resigned his commission as a, uh, he reached the rank of a captain. He told me once that his father, he said, you did not have to twist his arm to get him to speak out on an issue. All you had to do was ask. There was another uh, Marine told me that he said, if you ever wanted Colonel Ripley's opinion, actually it was Tom that told me this, if you ever want, wanted his father's opinion on anything, all you had to do was ask but you better be ready for the answer. And I think the reason, one of the main reasons that our society, our world is in the situation we're in today is because men have not stepped up to the plate and not uh, had the moral courage to face the issues of the day, to speak out for fear of being different from others or being isolated or being persecuted. We need to overcome that. And Colonel Ripley is an example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what, what was that line again when he thought, um, you know, he, he was going to likely die? He said, uh, once you stop being cluttered with that feeling, you're free, basically. So, men, if that's you're in free. the face of physical death, what are, what are we fearing, right? Well, think about that. Reflect upon what your fears are. Be honest about them, right? And bring them to the Lord and say, Lord, this is where my fears are. And, um, and how can I let these go? How can I do the good even in spite of this feeling of fear in these areas? What if everybody um, hated me that I'm afraid of what they think of me um, if I choose the good? Let the Lord fill you. Let the Lord fill you with his grace. Let's keep diving into the sacramental life. Get to mass and do the good. Go to confession. Let's keep going forward and encourage one another in virtue by our example and by our words. God bless you all. My name is Nathan Wigfield. 